my pleasure to introduce Trent Trombley for today's talk. And I believe everybody knows Trent. <laughs> um, would you like to say a few words? Okay. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself? No, I know pretty much everyone here, I think. <laughs> it's weird being on the other side. Let's um, put it that okay. way. So um, his title is From um, Saliva to Saints. Um, moral or oral hygiene in the Middle Ages and the case of late medieval um, Vilamagna. Vilamagna. Okay, please welcome Trent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, everyone see that okay? Okay. So uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, there's quite a bit to get through, so I think I'm just going to jump right in, uh, largely because I want to make sure there's enough time for discussion and questions and answers. I'm looking for a lot of feedback or any sort of comments that you guys may have. Um, so I'd like to start off by discussing the kind of context in which this work was conducted. This is a small side portion of a larger ongoing research project on the archaeological site of Villamagna, Italy. It was originally established as an imperial state under the Roman Empire before converting to a monastery in the Middle Ages. The following presentation is part of the bioarchaeological bio analyses conducted under the Human Remains Project at Villa, Villa Magna, co-directed by Sabrina Agarwal and Patrick Beauchene from the University of Michigan Dearborn, as well as in conjunction with colleagues from Sapienza University in Rome and the University of College London. These bioarchaeological analyses are aimed in part to glean an understanding of daily life and well-being within the late medieval community of Villa Magna by analyzing the cemetery skeletal assemblage that was recovered from the site from excavations throughout 2006 to 2015. What I'm going to present today are the data encompassing oral pathologies, anti-mortem tooth loss, cavities or caries, abscesses, calculus or tartar, and periodontal disease. I will first detail a brief etiology of each of these oral pathologies before discussing how they fit into broader bioarchaeological debates. We will then examine the results for such pathologies from Villamagna before expanding the discourse surrounding the mouth and the examining the ways in which people, medieval people, conceptualized, wrote, and depicted mouths and oral pathologies throughout the Middle Ages. My goal is to use the rich ethno-historic context avail available to us as a point of reflection for rethinking bioarchaeological practice in order to build a biohistorical synthesis with the medieval mouth as its focus. So let us begin with a brief account of the oral pathologies examined and their etiologies. Antimortem tooth loss is one of the first uh, oral pathologies we often look at in bioarchaeological skeletal samples. Antimortem tooth loss refers to teeth that have been lost or extracted prior to death in the individual. These teeth can be lost as a result of advanced cavities, which penetrate the pulp chamber and weaken the ligament to their corresponding sockets, advanced dental wear, intentional extraction, or from trauma. Bioarchaeologically, antimortem tooth loss is characterized by the resorption and remodeling or smoothing of bones surrounding the two sockets after loss. So this complete resorption and kind of bubbly texture we see here is indicative of antimortem tooth loss. Cavities, or caries in the bioarchaeological literature, are a multifactorial infectious disease whereby enamel surfaces of teeth are demineralized as a result of acetogenic bacteria within dental plaque. Dental plaque can adhere to the surface of enamel containing acid-rich or acid-loving and acid-producing bacteria such as streptococcus and lactobacillus species. These bacteria then ferment dietary carbohydrates and sugars to produce organic acids which reduce the resting pH level of the mouth and create an acidic environment which causes irreversible damage to enamel structures. Cavities are scored bioarchaeologically by the absence of enamel alongside the presence of decay. So we can kind of see this pit or hole here is uh, a classic kind of example of a pulp uh, perforation cavity. Abscesses are the result of cavities that infect and penetrate the pulp chamber of a tooth, then exit out the root. Infection of the pulp chamber can be caused either as a result of cavities pen penetrating the pulp chamber or from non carious pulp exposure through significant wear, as well as trauma. If severe, infection will become pyogenic, which leads to a substantial inflammation and the formation of a granuloma, or mass of inundated inflammatory cells. This granuloma then stimulates osteoclastic activity, right here, which begins to resorb surrounding bone as the inf inflammation continues to expand. Calculus, or tartar, 
is formed when salivary calcium phosphate minerals naturally precipitate out of the saliva, resulting in partially calcified substrate that adheres to the surfaces of teeth. While an incipient formation of calculus is not entirely understood, oral hygiene and the implementation of dentifrice technology, such as toothbrushing, appear to severely inhibit further accretions. Calculus is scored bioarchaeologically based on its presence, severity, and location within the oral cavity. So we can kind of see these chunks of almost cement looking structures adhering to the teeth here as calculus. Finally, periodontitis or periodontal disease is an advanced, forms, advanced form of gingivitis or gum inflammation and bacterial infection resulting in degeneration of the gingival or gum margins. While gingivitis is a relatively benign inflammation of the gums and affects adults, almost all adults who do not practice daily oral hygiene, periodontitis results in a malignant resorption and loss of irreplaceable bone that supports sockets for the dentition. In skeletal samples, periodontitis is often mark, uh, recognized by the marked porosity and kind of bubbles you see here, as well as exposed trabecular bone of the alveolar margin due to the resorption of the overlying bone. So essentially a recession where you could see the crown and the exposed root is often because this bone has been lost and dipped beneath where the crown meets usually the gums. The proximate causes of each of these pathologies are fairly well understood, yet their ultimate causes in relation to the ecology of the oral cavity is an, still an exciting frontier of research. Now, one of the most important factors regarding oral pathologies and oral homeostasis is saliva. This quote by salivary researcher Erwin Mandel laments to the fact that saliva is often underappreciated compared <laughs> to other bodily fluids, despite its immense capabilities of affecting oral cleanliness, taste, and digestion. As we can see from these diagrams, saliva is crucial to the oral cavity. I'm only going to focus on the dental aspect here of teeth, this highlighted in blue, uh, just to showcase how important saliva is. So we see that it's important in buffering, particularly with the result of phosphates, proteins, and bicarbonates. Uh, it protects against demineralization of the enamel surfaces, particularly with mucins. Uh, remineralization with slatherin and phosphates of particular importance. And then lubrication, uh, so to make sure that the mouth is not too dry. Again, mucins are a huge, play a huge role in this. Um, the chart on the right depicts the particular role in which saliva aids in remineralizing enamel surfaces that have become demineralized, often as a result of cavities or acidic, envir acidic environments. It's part of what we usually call the remin demin cycle, where phosphates and calcium are constantly cycling to protect against the kind of demineralized portions of cavities. Despite its importance, saliva's importance, Bioarchaeologists and dental anthropologists have been slow to pick up on the magnitude with which saliva has affected the teeth they examine. Recently, a handful of scholars have underscored the importance of saliva in relation to cavities and oral pathologies observed in archaeological populations. This has helped to bring saliva within the fold of dental anthropology, but not without its challenges. Firstly, reconstructing saliometric and saliochemical profiles in archaeological samples is near impossible. There is no saliva that exists. And clinically, salivary content and salivary flow varies tremendously from person to person, throughout the time of day, bodily position, and with stimulation such as food, as many of you are experiencing right now. <laughs> Second, advocates for the salivary hypothesis have advanced their claims within a larger umbrella of reproductive <coughs> ecology. Under this model, it is proposed that females are innately prone to higher frequencies of cavities and other oral, patho oral pathologies due to hormonal fluctuations throughout the life course, particularly at events such as pregnancy. Such hormonal fluctuations are suggested to result in a decrease in salivary production, quantity, and chemical quality, ultimately failing to protect and buffer teeth against acetic bacteria in cavities. It is worth noting that the advocates of this salivary hypothesis um, have posed that increased female cavities is a near universal in bioarchaeological samples, oftentimes synthesizing bioarchaeological results alongside biomedical and clinical research in contemporary Western women. Now, traditionally, bioarchaeologists have subscribed to a different model, a dietary or behavioral model, whereby oral pathologies are explained in relation to subsistence practices, food ways, or other behaviorally centered actions. This view remains the predominant view in bioarchaeological practice, though has come with a potential cost of ignoring the importance of clinically demonstrated salivary research. If sex differences in oral pathologies are observed, they're often explained on the basis of gender differences in diet and subsistence. 
As such, if females are observed to have higher amounts of cavities in a bioarchaeological population, it's often explained as females having a higher reliance on starchy cultigens compared to their male counterparts. The opposition of these models should be met with caution, though their separation illustrates the difficulty with which bioarchaeologists have wrestled with biocultural models. We know that the proximate causes of cavities and oral pathologies quite well. Rather, the debate entails what are the ultimate causes. The decision of where to draw the line between biology and culture in relation to dental ideologies is one that offers, often differs from researcher to researcher. Ultimately, this debate underscores issues in scale and what is considered more important within the biocultural spectrum. With this in mind, we can turn to the case of Villamagna and see what medieval dental tissues might reveal about our models. So to give kind of a brief context of the study, uh, Villa Magna was a large, around 17 hectare imperial estate located in the Sacco Valley of the Lazio region, approximately 65 kilometers southeast of Rome. The site was initially established in the second century, century as an estate under the Roman Empire, where it was frequented by young Marcus Aurelius prior to becoming emperor. After the fall of Rome, it was established as a monastery in the late 10th century before transforming into a castrum, or fortified village in the 13th and 14th centuries, though we aren't exactly sure where people were living during this time period. Archaeological excavations were carried out from 2006 to 2015 as part of a large international research project, which discovered a cemetery skeletal assemblage in the process of excavating the medieval monastery in San Pietro Church. Burials have been discovered from the late antiquity period up to the late medieval period. In particular, this project focuses on the remains from the late medieval chronology, given the smaller sample sizes in the preceding periods. A total of 113 individuals were analyzed, representing just under 3,400 teeth. Though I'm only going to focus on a subsample of adults, as children are often tricky due to their varying levels of dental development as they grow. It is worth noting that the underrepresentation of older males, here, three, <laughs> has forced us to collapse the 30 to 49 and 50 year age categories into one category for the purposes of statistical comparisons. Now to kind of talk briefly about some of the evidence we have for dietary subsistence and foodstuffs of Villamagna, um, it's consisted largely, looks like it consisted largely of cereal cultigens and ter terrestrial herbivorous fauna. Documentary evidence from the central medieval period in the 9th and 11th centuries uh, at Villa Magna details records of produce and agrarian products tied to the mass monastic lands, such as wheat, barley, fava beans, and chickpeas. Subsequent zooarchaeological analyses of the winery discovered uh, vast evidence of terrestrial fauna domesticus, typical of medieval agrarian contexts, such as sheep and goat, pigs, cattle, oh, there we go, cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, and cattle, there we go. Previous stable isotopic research conducted by Nitsch at Villa Magna has also revealed interesting dietary trends. Analyzing stable nitrogen and carbon from human bone collagen, Nitsch discovered that not only did Villa Magna have incredibly low values compared to other Italian sites, but that females in particular showed markedly low nitrogen values compared to their male counterparts. <coughs> Nitsch suggested that the community that had monastic ties to Villa Magna likely had a large reliance on C3 cultigens. Low female values could reflect reduced access to protein compared to their male counterparts, but could also suggest that female fasting is a form of religious observance. Or additionally, the influence of crop manuring in male diets with increased nitrogen levels. With this brief context, let us see the results of the dental analyses at Villa Magna. So again, I'm gonna start with the anti-mortem tooth loss. And instead of presenting this in strict table format, I've decided to try to do more of a visual format with heat mapping. So essentially, the more green, the more likely it is for a tooth to be present, and the more orange or red, the more likely it's to be absent, right? And so what we end up seeing is that posterior dentition for both females and males was, significant, was lost at significantly higher portions than the front teeth, smiling teeth, right? Uh, but what's interesting to note is that women actually seem to lose quite a bit less teeth. On average, each individual lost three to four teeth before death, whereas males lost four to five. This is kind of surprising given a lot of the reproductive ecology model hypotheses as well as clinical evidence of women typically losing teeth before death much more than men. Now in terms of cavities or caries, there's two kind of ways to go about it. Um, 
The traditional frequency essentially looks at taking the number of teeth with cavities and dividing by the total number of teeth present. This is just a kind of classic ratio, right? Um, and when we do that and compare the males and females, we see no statistically significant difference. Now, the stats that I'm using here are what's called a G-test or a likelihood G-test. It's a part of the chi-squared family distribution. It's essentially using observed and ex expected counts, much like you would a chi-squared. It's just more conservative, because if you have large amounts of counts, like you often do with teeth, upwards of 3,400 teeth, uh, those results can often inflate uh, the statistical significance. So I decided to go with a G-test instead of a chi-squared test. What's interesting, though, is if we use this corrected factor, which is proposed by Lukacs, the main proponent of the, uh, of the reproductive ecology model, we end up seeing a statistically significant difference, but with males having more cavities than females. And what this correction factor does is essentially says that you take the number of teeth with cavities, but you add it to the number of teeth lost anti-mortem or before death with cavities. This is because in populations that have, a lot, have lost a lot of teeth before death, likely lost those teeth as a result of cavities. So you're accounting for these kinds of losses. And instead of just dividing by the total number of teeth observed or present, we're actually adding that to a total number of teeth lost anti-mortem as well. So it's essentially trying to create or correct for uh, false positives. And so what we end up seeing is not only do, does the prevalence completely jump in almost 9, 10% in the female and even higher in the males, but this, this difference actually uh, shows a statistically significant difference with males having more cavities, which I don't think Lukacs would be happy about. When we look at calculus, we see no statistically significant differences between the sexes. Um, teeth were heavily affected by calculus. About 65 to 70 percent of all teeth were affected by calculus or advanced tartar buildup. But generally speaking, for either age group, 18 to 29 or 30 to plus years, as well as total, there's no significant difference between males and females. We observe a similar thing with abscesses. Um, abscesses don't often occur too frequently, but even when they do, we don't really see any large difference going on with either age groups or when they're um, totaled between the age groups for sexes. And so um, similarly with the, um, with the calculus, we see no significant sex differences in abscesses. Now, when we look at periodontal disease, we do see something kind of interesting. So instead of using a GTS, I'm using what's called a relative risk ratio. This is a statistic commonly employed in epidemiology, and it's constantly used or frequently used to compare different groups for risk of exposure to diseases. So what this number essentially tells you is the times likelihood of a group having the pathology compared to the other. In this case, males across the board are at higher risk than females. Particularly in the 18 to 29 age group, males are 1.35 times likely to have periodontal disease than their female counterparts. 1.13 times likely in the 30 year age group. And if we total it all up, males in general have a 1.17 times likelihood of having periodontitis. Now, there's no real hypothesis test that we use for relative risk ratios. Instead, we use 95% confidence intervals. And if the confidence interval covers one, in other words, if the lower value and upper value uh, overlap one, we usually say it's not statistically significant. But these are pretty close, 0.99. And so we do think that males uh, have quite a bit more periodontal disease going on, which again is kind of surprising compared uh, under the reproductive ecology model. So altogether, what are the results from de uh, the dental analyses at Villamagna show? It shows that antemortem tooth loss affected both sexes similarly in terms of location, whereby posterior teeth were more likely to be lost before death. But that on average, on average for the entire population, three to five teeth were lost before death. But this uh, loss appears to have affected males more, particularly in the posterior dentition, more than females. In terms of cavities, we see that males showed a higher prevalence of cavities when compared to females, which was surprising given the ethnohistoric and isotopic analyses, which suggested that females had a restricted diet or restricted access to proteins and an increased reliance on starchy cultigens. <coughs> Finally, no significant differences were observed in terms of calculus or abscesses between males and females, though males did end up showing slightly higher values of periodontal disease. I think overall, these results were surprising and call into question both reproductive and dietary models. Under the reproductive model, we would expect far greater amounts of oral pathologies for females, particularly given the three times over-representation of older or 50-plus females compared to males. 
Sim similarly, the dietary model proposes that the ethno-historical and isotopic evidence of decreased female access to protein would preclude females as exhibiting higher amounts of oral pathologies, likely as a result of increased reliance on coarse cultigens. Our results support neither of these hypotheses fully and underscore the error in debating something as complicated as cavities as an all or nothing mutually exclusive model. Furthermore, such debates, debates reveal more about the researcher's stance in the field and less about the people who were actually studying. As such, to move away from this, I would like to reposition the analysis of dental <laughs> tissues to include, to include the people in which they were embedded and incorporate a variety of sources beyond disciplinary bounds to try and elucidate what such pathologies and tissues meant to medieval people. So to date, we do not have many, any documents relating to the oral hygiene specific to Villa Magna, but we can draw more generally from continental Europe on medieval conceptions of the mouth and oral health care. The lack of sources is in part an issue in historiography whereby the history of dentistry has largely been ignored prior to Pierre Fauchard and his seminal 1728 volume, Le Chirurgien Dentiste, I'm not even gonna butcher that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Pierre Fauchard is widely considered the father of modern dentistry, and as such has been celebrated in historiography for his separation from his seemingly backwards medieval forebears. What information we do have about pre-modern dentistry has actually not been examined by historians, but rather by modern dentists with historical interests. As such, what follows is a temporally and spatially broad exploration of the ways in which pre-modern dentistry and medi medieval mouths were conceptualized. Yet, one cannot begin to understand medieval mouths without first going back to classical notions upon which medieval conceptions were built. We begin with Hippocrates of Kos, the famous Greek medical philosopher and purported father of Western medicine. In his treatise on breaths, Hippocrates explained the importance of one's breaths. Now bodies of men and animals generally are nourished by three kinds of nourishment, and the names thereof are solid food, drink, and wind. Wind in bodies is called breath, outside bodies is called air. It is the most powerful of all in all, and is worthwhile examining its power. So great is the need of wind for all bodies that while a man can be deprived of everything else, both food and drink for two, three, or more days, and yet live, yet if the wind passages into the body be cut off, he will die in a brief part of a day, showing that the greatest need for a body is wind. Aristotle similarly wrote that uh, road of winds is the earthly exhalations of the cosmos. Some 500 years later, Galen of Pergamon, the famed surgeon of Rome, repositioned air as more internal to the body, articulated as pneuma, the product of inhaled air, inhaled air that passes through the lungs and then into the left ventricle of the heart before being ignited with hot blood, resulting in the seat of the soul. Hot, in this sense, refers to the humoral theory of disease, whereby the four bodily humors, black bile, yellow or red bile, phlegm, and blood, were associated with different temperatures, consistencies, and resulting temperaments. The tremendous impact of Galeno-Hippocratic humoral theory in the Middle Ages was largely fostered by the 9th century translational movement into Arabic and, distri and distributed throughout the Islamic world and Christendom. Perturbations in harmonious humoral faculties could be treated with humorally calculated dietary regimens. Remedies then were often dietetic, as different foods held different humoral compositions and therefore could be mobilized as prescriptions to recalibrate humoral imbalances. Galen articulated nutrition as one of the three natural faculties of man and food as one of the six non-naturals or hygienic regimens external to the body that could impact internal humors. The dietetic nature of food in humoral theory situated the mouth then as a crucial, crucial entry point, the foyer, for medicinal care. Galen's suggestion that a healthy life was a moral obligation is furthered by the hygienic and dietary regimens that accompanied them and the oral cavities that processed such culinary medicaments. In this sense, the mouth was not just a bodily orifice, but a cosmological one as well, a portal for the soulful breath and medicinal care. The Greco-Roman tradition, drawing from Hippocrates' on breaths, Aristotelian winds as celestial and cosmological earthly exhalations, and Galenic notions of pneuma position the breath as integral with the natural world and philosophy. However, the internalization of air as a vital life force meant that it could be corrupted in situ and then spread outwards through the mouth should the humors be improperly aligned. Breath, was corrupted, breath that was corrupted was no longer soulful pneuma, but rather miasma, the long-held notion that contagion and illness were spread through bad air. 
Justin Stearns' work on medieval conceptions of contagion and disease suggests that diseases were conceived endogenously, from the inside out, not from the outside in, with the mouth as the ultimate place of contagion and uh, contraction. In this sense, the oral cavity acts as both a receptacle and a vector for disease and illness. And so we can see this kind of famous sermon in the top quote here, that the air may be corrupted through the influence of heavenly bodies or through mi some mixture of elements from which a corrupting smell is emitted. We receive this air through the mouth, and after a man has been corrupted, all the air that he inhales and exhales is corrupted by the corruption that he carries within him. And this image on the left here is from a famous Latin manuscript, the Omni Bonum. And while we don't exactly know what's going on in this image, we have essentially a practitioner, what might be a dentist, with extraction irons, trying to extract teeth, and then we see this kind of snaky black figure with all the teeth attached to it, probably indicating something like miasma. Yet the means by which disease could spread via the mouth could vary. While a number of disease and illnesses were thought to be spread through respiratory pestilence, conceptualized as airborne pathogens, diseases could also spread through language. In a 15th century Salamanca manuscript, a Castilian preacher suggested that leprosy was a disease of the mouth, whereby those who spoke ill of others resembled nothing as much as lepers whose mouths also stank. The preacher suggests to keep sinful speakers at a distance and follow Christ's advice to keep one's mouth clean of foul speech. Leprosy in this case was likened and contracted to sinful speech acts rather than airborne pathogens. It had a potential and had potential repercussions for physical proximity to others. Bodily visuals, surfaces, aesthetics, and odors were particularly important in medieval social relations. And as such, it may be no surprise that one's breath could be laden with moral and religious underpinnings. Such corruption did not affect all equally, and oftentimes pestilence was associated with gender conceptions of the female body. The medievalist Brenda Gardner Walter suggests that the famous lines, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air, and the witch's behavior depicted in Shakespeare's Macbeth was actually drawing on earlier medieval notions of witch physiognomy and humoral theory. Women were especially prone to the aforementioned internalized notion of toxicity and pestilence as their wombs, conceptualized as the one internal difference between the sexes, were thought to be humorally cold and moist, thereby tempering respiratory air and beyond the possibility of ever achieving a vital soulful pneuma. This could prove disastrous for female temperament, particularly in older women, as their bodily capacity for humoral heat was thought to be nearly extinguished by old age. Finally, if not purged regularly, the menses could rot, producing fumes and gases that would rise up through the orifices, corrupt the eyes, the breasts, the brain, and thereby psyche and temperament, and as well give the telltale sign of festering corruption and witchcraft, foul breath. Thus, witchcraft and its associated physiognomy were predicated on moral and biological explanations of aged and gendered bodies, drawing on a longer tradition of oral vapors, airs, and their phenomenologically associated odors. In both pathogenic and linguistic con concepts of contagion, and in the case of witch physiognomy here, the mouth reflects larger religious and moral anxieties about the finality of the soul, embodying illness, gender, and age. As such, given the gravity with which gender conceptions of physiognomy were associated with mouths and their odors, it's no surprise then when Catherine Crowcroft, an English literature scholar specializing in medieval theological con concerns of the mouth and lying, states silence, the closed orifice, is most often encouraged as the best ornament of, the wo of a woman in the Middle Ages. Now the power of mouths could actually reach beyond humans as well. In a critical assessment of Revelations 9.17 through 9.19, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Beatus of Lebana, states, by these three was the third part of men killed by fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths, because the power of horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Another recurring image in medieval Christian theology was the depiction of hell mouths, monstrous beings whose mouths were the entrance of hell itself. These depictions were common in a variety of media, but were often associated with the last judgment or Christ's triumphant descent into hell in Christian theology. And we see a couple examples of illuminated manuscripts here, and there's also the uh, example from the opening title slide. Perhaps one of the most interesting uh, forms of the hell mouth could take was in the form of a prop in medieval theater. We see here, the depiction of a hell mouth uses a prop which would not only scare the audience, but also act as a trap door 
so that actors and actresses could enter and exit the stage through the grisly symbolism of a monstrous theological mouth. I chose this image not only for the depiction of a Hellmouth prop, uh, it's not working, okay, kind of working, uh, but also the obvious foreground. We see here a woman tied down with a, by a number of men with a particular individual here poised with long extraction irons extracting her teeth. This is Saint Apollonia, the patron saint of dentistry and toothaches. In this small church of San Bernardo of Monte Carasso in the Italian side of Switzerland, we see in the upper right corner a 15th century mural once again depicting, depicting the forced extraction of Saint Apollonia. She was originally a deaconess of Alexandria in Egypt when an uprising in, and riot against Christians in 249 resulted in her capture. She was then tortured by having all of her teeth extracted one by one before escaping her captors and self-immolating. Her martyrdom helped her to become canonized by Pope John XXI in the 13th century as the patron saint of dentistry. She's often depicted with forceps, gripping a tooth, oftentimes a molar, as well as the palm of the martyr, as we see here. Uh, and in other images or iconography, she's depicted with a book uh, symbolizing her educated life in Alexandria. In his early 14th century manuscript, Rosa Anglica, John of Gaddison wrote extensively on treating toothaches for medieval people and was likely well-read among non-professionals. In one prescription, John writes that anyone who prays to St. Apollonia on February 9th, her feast day, would likely have their toothaches cured. While she's been depicted in medieval churches throughout England with an extension of 55 representations in the Isle alone, St. Apollonia appeared to carry a tremendous following throughout medieval Europe, given her uh, artistic depictions in, a vary, in varying forms of media, from stained glass to tapestries and even to screen panels. Of particular concern here uh, is the church covenant that was constructed in her name in the late 16th century in the Trastevere district of Rome, purportedly holding much of her bodily relics. Though the church was destroyed in the 19th century and no longer exists, the adjacent Piazza di Santa Apollonia, where the church faced, remains a toponymic remnant of its past and her power. Now, perhaps the most famous relics of St. Apollonia, her famed ablated teeth, are housed in the Sede de Porto in Portugal, down here, and the Cathedral of Assumption of Virgin Mary in Rob, Croatia, up here. The former represented by what appears to be a lower molar, and this by a premolar. Pilgrimages to Apollonia's relics were likely common throughout the late medieval period, underscoring the importance of what uh, things like toothaches and dental pain could drive people to move across vast distances. However, Apollonia's bodily relics appear to have been employed so much circulation by the 15th century that their authenticity came under question. Concerned with the abundant circulation of dental relics in, the 15th, century, in 15th century England, King Henry VI ordered all relics to be gathered, likely for authentication purposes. What resulted was over a ton of teeth that were collected in the central plaza and leading the 17th century chronicler Thomas Fuller to write, were her stomach proportionate to her teeth, a country would scarce afford her a meal. <laughs> now apocryphal as these tales may be, uh, such tales reveal fascinating insight into medieval oral health care. While a number of medievalists have thoroughly researched the circulation and commodification of relics, such a tale begs the question, where would these purported dental relics of Apollonia, i.e. the ones that certainly did not belong to her, come from? The removal of remains after death seems unlikely, except for the cases of, of the recently deceased in the Middle Ages. Thus, were individuals complacent in the intentional ablation or extraction of their own teeth in order to be marketed or commodified as relics? We may never know answer to such questions, and although highly improbable, I found it certainly entertaining to think of our bioarchaeological colleagues working on anti-mortem tooth loss in medieval British remains might be in part caused by the intentional extraction for reliquary purposes rather than the cause of cavities or oral pathologies. Interestingly, much of what we know about the medieval extraction of teeth comes from art historical analyses of St. Apollonia herself. By seriating a large number of artistic representations of Apollonia in, vari in a variety of media, from paintings to relief carvings, José de Paiva Boleo argues that the iconographic depiction of Apollonia's extraction irons correspond to temporal understandings of dental anatomy. The extraction irons are the iconic prime identifier for St. Apollonia, so it must be disclosed that they're often depicted in larger scale than they would have normally occurred. 
Nevertheless, seriation of iconography shows early depictions of having long rods leading to bulky C-clamp clasps. The breadth and bulkiness of the claws could only grasp so far as the cemento enamel junction, basically the tip of the crown here. This paired with the long straight rods suggests that teeth during the Middle Ages were pried in a motion similar to how nails are extracted with the back of a hammer. The, pr the process was likely disastrous as the inability to grasp the root and failure to understand how roots were curved with a prying motion meant that the fracturing or complete breakage of a tooth crown from its root was common. Extraction iron morphology, unfortunately, did not systematically change until the 18th century, like we see here, whereby large C-clasps were replaced with finer, what we call longer bird, be bird beak clasps to get far down as root to the roots as possible, and the rods were shortened and curved to allow for smoother extractions. Such changes in technology corresponded directly with understandings in dental anatomy, particularly noting how tooth roots were curved and not straight like nails in a board. Changes in extraction technology were slow, and as such, it's likely that many people throughout the Middle Ages experienced painful extractions or dental procedures. It is no surprise, then, that late medieval dentists were portrayed as charlatans or quacks. So this is Lucas van Leyden's kind of famous painting or engraving, The Dentist, in which we have a dental professor or professional here extracting a tooth, and the dental assistant is pickpocketing the man. <laughs> dentists were not enjoying a very good career throughout the Middle Ages. Similarly, in the case of Hieronymus Bosch's beautiful Haywain triptych, we see at the bottom of the center plant panel here a depiction of a quack dentist in a semi-dunce cap with a string of teeth around his neck, the sign of a traveling dentist or vagabond. Behind him on the table are a variety of curiosities, but in particular is a small depiction of a worm. Now, the famed 10th century medieval Arabic physician, Al-Razi, seemed to be intensely concerned with separating himself from charlatan dental practice. And his famous example of critiquing charlatanism focuses on dental health care and extraction practices. In his book of medicine for Al-Mansur, he describes a folk petty treatment whereby the charlatan or dentist would secretly place a worm into someone's mouth and then remove it so that the patient could visually see that it had been removed from a cavity, thus relieving toothaches. Despite a number of medieval physicians detailing such apocryphal examples, the, etiology, the etiological conception of worms as the cause of cavities might have been more widespread than anticipated. Drawing on multiple sources from throughout medieval Europe, David Garabek suggests that the etiological conception of toothworms was not systematically questioned until the 18th century with, once again, Pierre Fouchard's La Chère Dentiste. Rather, the conception may become popularized by the first century Roman physician Scribonius Largus who stated that after fumigating the mouth with henbane and a rinsing of water, small toothworms will fall out in the process, thus relieving toothaches and cavities. Other scholars had similarly argued that toothworms were a widespread idea throughout Europe, reinforced by famous physici physicians such as Ibn Sina and Paracelsus, though with regional differences, such as the Germanic reference to Zandwurm throughout the 9th and 10th centuries. Medical treatment could vary from the direct extraction of worms with pincers to rinses that would chase the worm out of the cavity or abscess. Fumigations appeared to have been particularly popular, whereby herb poultices would be ignited and the patient would inhale the resulting smoke to chase out the worm. Aside from hembane, prescriptions of tansy also appear to have been prevalent due to their ability to destroy worms. Interestingly, worms could also be medicinally prescribed as a means of accelerating the removal of teeth that was aching. The famous 11th century Arabic physician Ibn Sina and his canon of medicine details that cabbage caterpillars could be placed on a plainful tooth so that they may eat away the tooth fully. Finally, seen in this 18th century image here taken from the manuscript 256, we see the presence of worms within a cross section of a tooth. Altogether, and this survives up into the 18th century. Altogether, the varying successes of tooth worms as an ideological explanation for medieval dental pains suggest that an attack on charlatanism might have been more exceptional and further helps to historically contextualize oral health care and hygiene in the Middle Ages without rendering worm etiologies as backwards. Now finally, even today, St. Apollonia carries a degree of significance in relation to dental care depicted in Catholic prayer cards. The prayers allude to earlier medieval forms of worship in her name, which often include a passage along the lines of, O glorious Apollonia, patron saint of dentistry and refuge to all of those suffering diseases of the teeth, I consecrate myself unto thee. 
What's even more interesting is that beyond prayer cards, processions and recognitions, as well as venerations of relics, are still practiced in parts of Europe to honor St. Apollonia. In the Belgian city of Tournai, a procession takes place during the month of September every year, whereby the silvered reliquary arm and relics belonging to St. Apollonia are paraded. In the Flemish region of Belgium, an old tradition of celebrating St. Apollonia's feast day on February 9th is accompanied by the special baked good, Gutlingen, or pancakes, which are supposed to help provide year-long immunity to toothaches. I bring these up not only to highlight the vibrant ways in which St. Apollonia is still worshipped today, but also to underscore issues in bioarchaeological analyses. I do indeed think that we should heed S.C. Humphrey's warning that it is all too easy for the social anthropologist or the historian to produce examples of burial forms or artifact patterns of which the archaeologist would never guess the meaning without help from ethnographic sources. However, what bioarchaeologist would deduce in their right mind that a pastry laden with carbohydrates and sucrose would be mobilized as a form of oral health care? Such morsels illustrate that toothaches, cavities, and all manner of oral pathologies are not mere biological pathologies with etiological pathways to trace, but rather they embody social acts, a means of coming together to bake, to celebrate, to pray, and to prevent. Though this is not to say that bioarchaeology cannot contribute immensely to such investigations. The dearth of archival and art historical evidence on what medieval mouths were like necessitates bioarchaeological analyses. A rather crude and macabre example will illustrate. While none could deny the pain that St. Apollonia had to endure with the forced extraction of her teeth, a bioarchaeologist could inquire as to how many teeth she had left in the first place, particularly since she was purportedly of older age. Furthermore, bioarchaeologists have the potential to research forms of oral hygiene and healthcare at a local level. Preserve microcharcoal remains from dental calculus using techniques such as pyrolysis, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry may be informative. Such an analysis reveals the carbonized remains of plants that were inhaled as smoke, which in the context of medieval Europe and the aforementioned conceptions of toothworm may lead more credence, or lend more credence to the fumigation techniques as a widespread and physically embodied practice rather than a fringe or folk remedy as has often been claimed. Similarly, which teeth were lost or cared for throughout the oral cavity is not readily accessible to historical documents or artistic imagery. While the loss of rear teeth before death likely corresponds to mechanical and dietary demands of coarse cultigens, how might the retention of front teeth affect daily life? What might the retention or loss of smiling teeth reveal about medieval aesthetics? Given the importance of oral pathologies in facilitating halitosis, or bad breath, bioarchaeologists are relatively poised to comment on such conditions and explore their social ramifications. What might one's breath reveal about their moral position in society, or even physical proximity to one another? The medieval mouth was likely a daily topic of conversation, and if not, it certainly was an aspect of daily life, capable of receiving care, spreading disease, entangling itself in academic debates, and ingesting the classical soul. The medieval mouth and its accompanying dentition, if anything, seems to be a vital place to start scholastic dialogues. It seems only right to consider, consider such a biosocial orifice beyond the confines of disciplinary lines, and reposition ourselves to not only analyze teeth for their biological information, but understand them as biosocial tissues, embedded with meanings to the people whom they belonged. Thank you. Laurie. I'll have more for later, but <laughs> given, given the, the whole idea about um, bodies being hot and cold mm -hmm. and our scene is being hotter, that has implications in some societies for the heat. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's any consideration in terms of differences of male and female isotopes and heavy, whether there may be a correlation between hot foods, cold foods, and what are seen as more appropriate for women to be Mm -hmm. No, it's a great question. I mean, at least in the case of Villamagna and the isotopic research done there, uh, I, think the, I think that Nietzsche did a good job of contextualizing her findings in relation to fasting. And this in part comes out of uh, Carolyn Bynum Walker's work with Holy Feast, Holy Fast, and talking about the ways in which uh, fasting for women might be a form of religious observance. And so she says it might not be that men are controlling all the resources or protein, it might be actually a form of religious expression. In terms of humors, and at least in terms of, I think isotopes directly tied with humors, it hasn't, 
I don't think it's quite been explored yet, um, which is interesting because most of the med medical practice was dietary and it was dietetic. And it was partially because you were trying to recalibrate your humors based on different dietary regimens. And so. And certain kinds of flesh were avoided because yeah. of its. Its humoral uh, like capabilities, exactly. And so it's something that. I think the, the humoral, the, the delving into the historiography of humoral theory is like something I'm, I'm still trying to kind of scratch at. And I think it has huge ramifications for things like isotopic results, huge. Uh, but I haven't quite seen it discussed, I think, fully. Yeah, Maureen. So, um, this was fascinating, yeah. thank you. And yeah. it was great to see the visuals, too. <laughs> greater incidence among males, mm -hmm. whether it might be a byproduct of more access to certain medicinal, and I'm mm. thinking of sugars, mm -hmm. because, I mean, I only have, um, I haven't like looked at many, uh, mainly like early modern lists of like apothecary bills for the Archbishop of Florence in the 16th century. Right. It's just a Sugar, yeah. And um, so, you know, I don't know uh, what's been done, on, but I would guess there might be differential access to like yeah. expensive medicines yeah. like sugars and whether sugar could um, therefore be more used by men for other, like to treat other things, yeah. but in fact have this result. This result yeah. I think that's one of the things that, uh, I think that's a really good point in terms of sugar and its direct impact and like the social currency of sugar in the Middle Ages, right? Uh, I think it gets back to the kind of, I think, frustration I often have with the adaptationist kind of view that some people who look at dental tissues will interpret it as more cavities means they were doing something silly or wrong and not really contextualizing it in terms of the social currency of, say, sugar. Uh, and I, I was trying to kind of hint at that with the pancakes, right? Like this kind of sucrose carbohydrate laden thing was actually a form of like oral health care and is in a way. Uh, and so I think, I think the, in terms of Villamagna explaining the kind of differences, there's a lot going on. And I think the cleavage of these kind of models that we've seen at least in bioarchaeology needs to again be met with caution. And I think acknowledging the kind of biological forces of, um, a lot of what I'm interested in is kind of mechanical force and the actual rate of attrition and teeth mm -hmm. adhering to one another. Particularly as you start to lose teeth, it puts more force on other teeth to occlude. And so that's something that we're looking kind of more at like a biomechanical way. But uh, in terms of dietary impact, I think that there was probably differences in diet at Villa Marnia between males and females. Um, but we don't really know exactly what those are yet. It's something that I think we might work with Caroline a little closer because a lot of the central medieval documents at least are detailing uh, more on like what the actual food and domesticates and products were. But I'm not sure at that level. Yeah. Interesting, thank you. Christine? Thank you very much. Um, three, three, th three quick things. Mm -hmm. One, um, the higher protein might be males doing different things, mm -hmm. for example, hunting, mm -hmm. or having access to hunting. So if you looked at the faunal remains, there might be some evidence of course, you talked about the domesticates, but they're still living off yeah. the land. So you might look at the faunal remains yeah. to see about that, which would explain the higher yeah. faunal. Um, two, is there any evidence in the teeth of, you mentioned um, pressure, or yeah. fancy word, um, but teeth grinding and, and I mean, in theory, you should be able to see that. And that might lead to not only increased events of disease, back. but also yeah. tension yeah. and strife of individuals, whether they're male or female. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. And then the third thing I just want to say really quickly is Chaucer yeah. talks a lot about the mouth. Yeah. So you can, t I've got a few quotes actually. Okay, <laughs> great, yeah. I had this great one uh, from Martin Luther, which is a different context, and I was told that it's a very different context, but it's a great quote on how all poisons and diseases are spread by the mouth and it's breathing. It's really just the acts of people breathing on one another and their sins are what's spreading all this disease, which is just awesome and interesting to me. Um, in terms of the kind of things going on with protein, uh, you know, I do think what, I didn't talk about wear, dental wear, and that's a, it's because it's its own bear and it's, I could go at length about how dental wear is scored and everything like that. What is interesting is that uh, males seem to show in the younger age group more wear, and then females in the older age group have more wear than the males. So it's kind of flip-flopped. 
uh, which is interesting because it's why would you have young men with such heavy amounts of wear if they're having access to meat and proteins, which typically don't think, at least bioarchaeologically, cause wear. And so I do think it could be grinding, it could be attrition. Uh, I think one potential example is, which niche goes a little bit into in isotopes, is the influence of manured crops and whether the increased nitrogen would potentially uh, result in these kind of coarse cultigens that might be masking, might be simulating something like protein consumption, but it's actually just well, coarse cultigens. Legumes. Yeah, and legumes. legumes. That's something we don't, yeah. Yeah. I think originally a lot of increased nitrogen values in a lot of parts of isotopic research in Italy are often interpreted in terms of diet, like marine resources, which is great, but we don't, I think we don't quite know what the influence of marine resources are at well, Villa Magna. Well, you can separate that new, with some new techniques. Yeah. But the other thing is, again, looking at the fall remains, yeah. if, you, if you find no seashells whatsoever, yeah. a lot of mm -hmm. probably not bring those in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of the kind of ways I've been trying to work through these, the, these prevalent, the prevalence of like cavities and caries and increased stuff in males um, has been interesting. And what I ended up mainly finding out is a lot of the kind of clinical research that's uh, advocated by the reproductive ecology model uh, has very, very small sample sizes, and it's based on modern, like, pregnant women, like, like 16 women or less, eight women in some cases. And so I don't know, and a lot of times they'll even chalk it up to things like snacking or uh, um, cravings and things like that. And so I think going, yeah, and so I think imposing that on any sort of, as a, as a bias or an expectation on the dental research is problematic. And so, uh, unfortunately, I think if you find when males have been found to have higher prevalence, it's just written off as an exception. Like there, there are exceptions and that's about it. And so I'm trying to kind of, at least trying to still tinker with the ways in which, how did males show these increased kind of prevalences and almost across the board in every oral pathology. So, yeah. Do I remember? Yeah. So pansy is just a problem with the reproductive model. Pansy is a really well-known abortifacient. And yeah. it's interesting they could be getting treated for deep things with something that could also be an abortifacient. Yeah. There's a lot on, I didn't go too much into it here, but there's a lot on like poultices and res, res, uh, like receipts or recipes, sorry, for poultices, poultice applications and quite a bit on some of the, uh, on the plants that were particularly used. Uh, and there's been some interesting re follow-up research with the kind of pharmacological properties of a lot of those plants. Uh, well, and some of those too, at the time, are going to be made into pills or mm -hmm. concoctions or syrups, and if they're syrups, they're gonna have the high sugar. Exactly. So you might also be getting something at, at what the properties being, being employed were of the plants. Mm -hmm. And the, and the preparation so techniques. So much here, it's so cool. Yeah, there's, the preparation techniques is a, is a complete bear of a thing that I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, the fumigations. So that's, where Maureen, that's where Maureen's comment makes yeah. a lot of sense. Too. Yeah, with the sugar. sugar. You know, if it's a syrup, they're using yeah. sugar as part of the. Do you know the ways in which, like, I guess the sucrose, like the sugars, were, where were they refined from? Or what were they referenced? Okay. I wasn't looking mm -hmm. at that when I found that. Of course. <laughs> Like bricks or something? Okay. They'll come in as cones, the way they're all. Okay. Definitely, monasteries often do produce inventories, particularly about the later Middle Ages. So, even if there's not that kind of documentation for Del Monia, yeah. it's a possibility of applying other references. Inventories of goods, purchases, and. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Maureen. Yeah, Sabrina. One of the sugar things is that sugar is sweet, though, isn't carriogenic, right? It doesn't cause cavities. It's got to be with the carb. Typically, yeah. With the medicine or something that's got it. I mean, the sugar, straight sugar, is not going to do nothing for your cavities. It's when it's got the carbs. So something like an alcohol mm -hmm. or a beer or something that's got the carb with the sugar is much more problematic. Yeah, because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's got to be a mixture, not just straight, straight sugar. 
Yeah, and, you know, again, with the dental wear stuff is, is really interesting uh, because the, the cavity, really, uh, the, the big thing is looking at how these oral pathologies link together, right? And I think uh, wear typically corresponds a lot with cavities in a way because the coarse cultigens are basically exposing different parts of the tooth. And dentin, if you get to the point where you've worn the enamel completely down to dentin, that's going to really expose the pulp chamber, which is why you start to see so many abscesses and lo teeth loss before death. Um, but it's hard, yeah. It, um, the refination of sugar, has, I think, has to be like contextualized, because it's not straight karyogenic. It's typically in relation with texture. Yeah. Yeah, Kent? So I came in late, so you may have covered this trend, but did you talk about in terms of the basically maintenance of the mouth and the teeth in terms of when brushing comes in? And is there gender and status differences? And when does mm -hmm. that come in? And does that really have any, any kind of effect in terms of what, of what you're seeing? Yeah, um, I think. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's a mouthwash pocket. Yeah. Um, no, it's a good question. I think uh, I didn't go too much into it in the beginning, in part because we, especially with like things like brushing teeth, we don't know a ton until again after this 18th century volume is published. And that's because dentists get really kind of uh, excited when that volume's published, because like, look, he's doing real science and he's separated himself from the kind of medieval people. Uh, so it means anything that kind of goes before him, we're still learning a lot about. And again, historians and historians of medicine in particular have not really been interested in dentistry. It's more on things, I think, like social history, but also plague. And so dentistry is already kind of underappreciated. And so what has been done in terms of that kind of research, it's often just dentists who maybe work with a historian or go to the archives on the weekend, in a way, which is good and bad. We've learned a lot, but we still have a lot of gaps. Um, in the case of medieval, like, brushing techniques, uh, the only real evidence we have is thick linen. So really coarse linen, and you would brush until you're, supposedly, you're supposed to brush until your gums bleed severely. Yeah, that was the prescription written, and which is interesting because then how would th something like that affect periodontal, gum disease, all these kinds of things. At Villa Magna, we have such heavy amounts of calculus. Sabrina's laughing because she's seen all these teeth. Uh, on the front, I mean, what's kind of interesting here is you can see this kind of lip, right? Because that's where the gums would have been. So there's so much gum inflammation going on that your bone has co almost completely receded a couple millimeters. Typically, two millimeters is what we use as a standard. And so if that starts to recede, it means that calculus starts to build directly into the gums. Uh, there was so, most of where the calculus was in Villa Magna was what we call interproximally in between the teeth, which means flossing was not probably practice. Uh, <laughs> floss your teeth. Um, but it's, it's, it's unfortunate because I'm really interested. Originally, I was basically just came across an article that was talking about um, oral hygiene in medieval Britain, and I was kind of interested in that, and they had this talk, yeah, and they had this discussion on linen as a form of like a toothbrush, but that was it. And since then, I haven't really found much else on what people were doing. Um, and it's just, I don't think it's written about. And particularly mid in the Middle Ages, dentists are, is not the greatest profession, and they don't enjoy the best portrayal, uh, mm -hmm. even in the Middle Ages, particularly later, like us. Um, we tend to relegate them as kind of quacks or charlatans, um, which is, has, 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 has its issues. Yeah. They're yeah. practitioners rather than a kind of intellectual. Exactly, exactly. All the yeah. And it's partly because a lot, of, a lot of what we think about medieval medicine is built on these kind of classical notions of you needing to be a middle, a, like a medical philosopher. You need to tie in things like philosophy and the cosmos to daily life and medical practice. That's why Hippocrates, Galen, and all these really famous um, Arabic scholars like Al-Razi and Ibn Sina become so prominent is because they're writing about philosophy and how it relates to health. Now what's interesting, and I didn't get to go into it here, but I definitely want to look into it for potential dissertation research in Iberia. Uh, Iberia, even though it is Arabic, starts to wholesale reject Arabic medicine in a way. And you see written prescriptions from, uh, there's a copy of one of these big philosophical medical volumes received in Spain. And the, pra the Arabic practitioner says, this is overly esoteric and theory heavy. I'm just going to rip the edges and use them as prescriptions for my patients. So it's kind of interesting to see how those things translate throughout, uh, throughout Europe. And it's, there's a lot of variability. Chris? Um, 
two questions yeah. involving uh, involving Mm -hmm. Is there uh, is there any pathological evidence that can be matched with a method of tooth extraction on the things that you're looking mm -hmm. at? Uh, and then I guess uh, more more generally, is there a way to tell if teeth were uh, either removed with long handled blunt mm. forceps or if there are other things that are yeah. knocking people. Brawling, yeah. pugilists, yeah. Um, it's a good question. I would say, I think for the first question, I don't, I don't know. And uh, I think it's in part because if, depending on how long ago it happened, if it's happened like let's say 10 years before death, that's basically gonna completely smooth, o smooth over to where we have something more like this. Um, whereas there are some, um, I was at, a, at, the, at the Western Bioart Group conference, there was a particular person who's working on whether the holes that we see, say like, can't get this to work, but let's say at the top of the screen, right, we have like some of the teeth missing, but they're not resorbed. We typically score those as post-mortem loss, taphonomic curation issues. And she's arguing, well, how might that be related? How, how do you know? What if they lost it right before death? And again, it goes into these things of, what if people were using them for relics or trying to pawn them off as relics? Someone who's recently deceased, you extract a couple teeth and pawn them off as relics. And we would not necessarily know if it's anti-mortem or post-mortem because it hasn't had time to kind of do this bony change that we recognize. Um, I'd venture to say with trauma, if they died shortly after, you, would, you could maybe know, but it's hard to know. And it's partially because we don't have the teeth that are extracted. So 16-year-old so, had their teeth knocked out? Yeah. It all looks the same, it washes out. And what you'd end up getting actually is something more like this. Um, this whole thing, and you can see it's like a dip. That's because it's basically completely smoothed over. This happened a long time ago that those teeth were lost. Um, what is interesting, I think, is just thinking about these kinds of um, heat maps, right? And how it fits in uh, somewhere there. Um, What's interesting is how much the first molars are lost. And I think using this as kind of a check for the way that we assume how teeth look or should, should work or look, let's say in modern Western, particularly American society as being all there, straight, clean, white, uh, is interesting because you don't really have crowding going on in these mouths like we do with wisdom teeth in part because the first molars get lost. And so you end up freeing up space for other teeth to come in, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, all green. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, you know, one of the things I was mentioning to Maureen right before, and I gave a version of this talk in, uh, in Lisbon, and one of the scholars was saying, well, it's very interesting that you're doing all this, but you know like America has quite a reputation for how their mouths look and like how obsessive you guys are with the cleanliness. And, and I was like, that's a good point. And it's kind of thinking about, do we assume then, are these anti-mortem tooth, like uh, ratios of anti-mortem tooth loss, it's like, oh, they lost it, it's a pathology. Or is that just part of normally what happens and we're just kind of fixated on keeping everything there and clean and pristine. So those are some of those things that I think larger ideas I'm trying to still think through. Nico. Can you perceive uh, regional differences in naturally occurring fluoride? Mm. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things, I'm not sure about naturally occurring, you'd probably have to do some more like, I'm guessing like semi-hydrological research or uh, at work at a landscape scale, which would be great. Um, one of the things I am particularly interested in, uh, potentially for my dissertation research, is to look at the impact of what's called miswak, which is basically the toothbrush plant, part of the Salvadora persica tree, that is prescribed in uh, uh, hadiths by the holy prophets of Islam as a form of religious expression and moral obligation to keep your teeth clean by brushing them with this toothbrush plant. Uh, and pharmacologically, it has very high levels of fluoride. And it's actually been studied by the World Health Organization for its ability to be used in areas where there aren't access to dental care, particularly in East, northeastern Africa and in the peninsula. And so that's one potential aspect, like I guess a pharmacological, pharmacological aspect of a particular plant species that I would be interested in looking at. But 
I'm not sure in terms of fluoride. I don't know if it's been fully uh, discovered yet. You get that from hydrology. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I think hydrological. I don't think it's an area of fluoride, but yeah, different springs will have it. Yeah. In, in this part, the Saco region. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. A lot of work's been done now, particularly with like things like the World Health Organization. On They use this method or this metric that's used all over the world called the DMFT score. And they basically will give each country and each little region a score based on how many teeth are basically worn, trauma, filled, um, or decaying. And so that score has been used all over the world in almost every country. And so they've started to kind of use that and correspond it with modern fluoride uh, geology and hydrology. But in terms of medieval, I'm not sure. But that's a really good question. Yeah. Is that it? Oh, Maureen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.